Welcome to Uncomfortable, conversations about culture and Christianity. My name is Eric, and today I am joined by Alex. Hey, hey, hey. Across the table there. We also have Glenn back for another episode. What's up? Your second time here. Mm-hmm. And we have a, a very special guest with us mm-hmm. today, uh, Mr. Roy Hello Jr., uh, Former Husker, mm-hmm. former NFL player. Keep it coming. Uh, I, I mean, uh, handsome. Yeah. Is there anything else you want me to say? <laughs> that was the one I was hoping he was you'd looking for. Oh, okay, to. I got it. I got it out. Yes. All right, great. I know. Thanks for being with us here today. This yeah. is awesome. It's my pleasure. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the Nebraska state religion. Uh, you know, of Husker fandom and mm-hmm. what you know the good and the bad and everything that comes with that. Mm. Uh, maybe even you know take it from a Christian's perspective. What you mm. know, maybe how we should look at that as Christians. Uh, but other than that, we have to dive in with our three questions. It's it's the way you know. Whenever there's guest on, we got to ask these three questions. Mm-hmm. It's uh, uh, it's very important. Here we go. Your first question: uh, Have you ever had a nickname? And if so, what is it? Mm, I love this question. By the way, Glenn, thanks for being here. I see. That Thank they you allow for being here. Anyone? <laughs> they the bring table. in any guests, Praise man. God I was in here that. last week. It's crazy. <laughs> Feels uh, like they're kind of desperate. But nickname: Juke Master Speedy. <laughs> wow. There are a lot of descriptions in there. Yeah, and then a second one. So that was my sports name: Juke Master Speedy. Mm-hmm. That was my youth football nickname. That was the best. That was in my prime. Uh, and then in elementary school. Uh, Cisco Coco Appleseed. I don't know what it was about me. People would just compound adjectives. Cisco Coco Appleseed. Uh, back then, if you guys remember the thong song? Yes. Una so skin in it. That one. So I had dragon shorts that were too big for me, and they would always fall down at, at the playground. Oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah. So the girls, the girls got hot about that and started giving me nicknames. Cisco Coco because my complexion. Appleseed. That's a shout out to all the Bay Destrians in the Bay Area, California. We're so creative. Come on. Mm. Yeah. We have a lot of listeners from there. Yeah, so it's kind of like, <laughs> it's a hot spot. <laughs> They're going to be thankful for the shout out. <laughs> we do coast here on the Uncomfortable Podcast. Uh, all right. So second question. Uh, if you had a warning label, what would it be? <gasps> Glenn, I feel like Glenn has it for nope. you. Oh, okay. I was going to say. Caution. Here. No, it's warning. Warning. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Overthinks. Okay. Oh, overthinks. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Not as intimidating as I thought, but no. Still. Well, yeah. The other one may not be appropriate. That's oh, good. All right. Appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, Thanks for yourself. overthinking that part. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And this one's easy. Maybe. Oh, what's the last book you read? Mm, are we talking? Ooh, okay. Book Comic of the Bible. Book, book, no, okay. book. Yeah. We're not yeah. going book of the Bible. We just assume you're in there daily. Yeah. Okay. We're not. <laughs> Okay, then that would be uh, Holy Spirit by Chuck Smith, R.I.P. He's mm. yep, he's in heaven now. So he's a, it's former, a good man. Yeah, good man. Uh, I oh no oh no 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 here's nope. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's are you, are uh, you retracting? Yep, I'm retracting. Okay, because I just read a small book. You know how you kind of forget those ones. Yeah, yeah. it's just like only twenty pages. That would be Expository Preaching by David Helm. Mm. Fire. Mm. Yes. It's a good book. It's a good book. I've I've happened to have read that. I'm looking at redeeming love for the next one. If it's going to be like a fictional, that'd nice. be fun. Prancing rivers. No, who's S- a yeah something like Did that? Did you just say prancing rivers? Prancing. <laughs> wow, it sound, it came across. That's, so. That was my other nickname, by <laughs> the way. <laughs> Re, my Christian retail coming out. Yeah. Uh, all right. Awesome. Uh, let, let's dive into who you are. Let's give people, like, if they're not familiar, I mean, they should be. I'm sure they've done the research. We teased you out, you know, last week. We said this was like happening. Oh, I got to hear that. And uh, you're, you're our first guest with a Wikipedia page. Oh, good point. So we have uh, officially arrived. Uh, Glenn doesn't have one. Myron no. doesn't have a, a Wikipedia page? Hold on, hold on. Let's not I push to Myron. So. He's, past, <laughs> he's past due. He needs to get him a Wikipedia page. Yes. Well, we'll start writing Can you right create now. your own? Yeah, I think so. Okay. People can edit it, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did you create your own? No. Okay. No, but I was thinking that we, that Glenn was probably going to go that route. Yeah. <laughs> After he's been on the podcast two weeks in a row, why not? Yeah. It's probably time. He's becoming it's, famous. I know. He preached this past Sunday, in case you guys didn't know. Mm. You get so your, he's getting out there. <laughs> get your SEO up there. But what, uh, yeah, so give us a little bit of your history. Okay, quick history. Um, 
immediately uh one of six children so i have five other siblings uh we have uh four i have four sisters one brother tongan ethnicity so i think very uh family oriented um grew up in california in the bay area on the east side uh just in case you wanted to know in the valley over there um grew up playing ball got major affirmation as a youngin eventually uh went to the university of nebraska and uh got married almost immediately after graduation uh we have five kids their ages are five four three two one god bless <sighs> wow god bless Woosaw. so five kids right there uh four boys one girl i love the dynamic but it's also crazy when they're really young so uh you guys know this uh, every child is just has a different personality so it's very interesting yeah i know mm-hmm. yeah for sure yeah <laughs> glenn just yeah glenn has one child that I'll was get, we'll get joke. there maybe <laughs> so that's me um i love my bride um i love my children they're good gifts from god and um that's generally what i'm about um but we'll get into more details later okay. on. love it so so you said you played at Nebraska and you're from the Bay Area. Those that don't know, that's California because a lot of us Nebraskans <laughs> aren't super hip on knowing geography. Sorry about that. In uh, California. So how did you land in Nebraska? I mean, it's a pretty random Lincoln, yeah. Nebraska. Lincoln, Nebraska. I love how did, this How one. did you land here? Love telling this story. Uh, remind, this, remind my bride of this all the time. So I uh, got a scholarship in 2006 to play in 2007, my freshman year for Bill Callahan. Um, and, uh, I, I ended up taking that over other West coast opportunities and, um, it was the unexpected decision to make because a couple of things were going against coming to Nebraska. Number one, family and being Tongan. So those two things combined lend itself. If you, mo- <clears throat> most Tongans are, uh, they're going to stay on the coast, stay close to family because of the big support system there and so you, that's why you see Oregon you see UCLA all the Pac-12 schools end up having a bunch of Polynesians which is the ethnicity I am yeah and so what ended up happening was uh, I came here and uh, really enjoyed the visit because you knew it was about football and in California it's not about football you look at Cal was like number 10 or number five in the nation and they couldn't even pack their stadium so I was like oh this is really cool while we're leaving um we're taking off from Lincoln, going back to California, my my, uh, my freshman visit, the official visit in, in 2006. And uh, my mom asked, what do you think? And I said, no, mom, I'm not going there. I can't go there. And she says, okay, name one reason. I said, there are too many white people. <laughs> 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 and I'm not, that. that's just coming from literally, it's not a, don't read into this. I, it's simply the culture is so different. Yeah. When you grow up, uh, wherever you are, Midwest, East coast, South, West coast, uh, North, Northeast, you're just familiar and you think that's just life. So then when I came here, it was a huge culture shock with, um, with how supportive they were, which was amazing. But I also thought to myself, man, can I, can I really adapt to living here? You know, you're 17, a punk kid. And the values that you have aren't the values that I saw in Nebraska. So that was my initial uh, visit and eventually committed here. Um, And it was specifically because I wanted to play running back and I thought this is a good place to play running back. Cool. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Bill Callahan. Shout out to him. Got a a head coach job back this week. Yeah, he's interim coach at the Washington Redskins. Which you played for, right? Which I played, yeah. We, wow, yeah. a full circle. I follow, Small I world. know. Look at that. I follow hat. him. He follows me. I don't know. However you say it, we're in, we run tight circles. Love it. Love it. Love it. All right. So you're now you're a Husker. You're here in Nebraska. Like what's like what's what's the highlight? Like what's the what's the big memory from that experience? Oh, the there's one surface level one and a deeper one. Here's the here's the uh, surface level one. Uh, the highlight is two, 2010, I hate to toot my own horn here, I wish that you had actually told this, but I had a very good game, a very good game against Missouri in 2010, and uh, uh, set a record for uh, the single game rushing yard record, 
and 307 um, 307 that's 307. right 307 there you go i tooted it <laughs> 307 and um the greatest moment wasn't each run it wasn't um hanging out with the team after but it's the story of my dad and i through it and so what happened was uh Oak, we played oklahoma state prior to that the uh, pokes yeah, we beat them. So, um, anyways, they were undefeated. We beat them. There were none. So, what happened was, uh, <laughs> I was so proud of how I performed there because I thought if I can just run hard, that's just a win. So, my dad visits for the Missouri game. They're undefeated. They're number five in the nation. They just came off of beating the number one team in Oklahoma. Uh, so, they're coming to our house. And um, my dad, on a Thursday night, we play a game on Saturday. He ends up coming in and he says, uh, he, he lands and he says, "Take me to the film room." And so, I'm tired. I mean, we're done practicing, game preps all done. I take him up to the film room. Uh, the short of the long of it is he took me through, he stopped every play, and he said, talk through what you're supposed to do here. I talked through with him. Then he said, talk through what you saw. I said, oh, this is what I saw. And he said, well, why do you think you did well there? And I explained why. And each time he was making me think, well, what are you thinking, Dad? Am I not doing that well in these runs? And then at the very end, he summarized everything saying, you are impatient and you're substituting running hard for being for running through people when all you need to do is just wait and so uh from that oh man i'm just you know i'm a kid to a father relationship um man don't tell me what to do i got it i'm good i've had three years of playing good football but I, I knew down in the depths of my heart when I was going to sleep I, that he was right. And so immediately my dad lands. I'm thinking, really, you don't want to just hang with me? But that that was his way of showing me love. So then um, there you have it. Two days later, I actually applied it and had a good game. So that is my favorite memory I got to share with my dad. Then post-game, you just – oh, it's just such a dad-to-son uh, relationship – we went out to eat after, and I sat across the table with him, hoodie up, not just trying to have a private moment. And then I asked him, so what do you think, Dad? I did pretty good. Obviously. <laughs> yeah. I did. Yeah. But I just wanted to hear him say it. And uh, he said, yep, yep, you did good, son. That's my favorite moment in college outside of something that's a lot deeper. Yep. Mm. That's cool. I remember literally that's like one of my best memories that game i didn't play in it obviously. <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah, i love yeah. this as a i fan, just found this out as a fan i um my grandpa my grandpa was from western nebraska and so he, we my dad and, and myself and we wanted to create like a memory a family memory my grandpa's oh, that's right. health was failing and, and all that kind of stuff and so my dad worked out from one of his friends to get some really good tickets, get a, a handicapped parking spot, wheel him up to, to where we were going to sit in the, in the club section so we could have this amazing memory. And I just remember that game, like it was a huge upset. Like you ran like a, a madman for over 300 yards, which is just insane. And I just remember like being there with my grandpa, that was like one of our last memories together. And so for me, that mm -hmm. game literally has always like mm -hmm. stuck out in wow. my mind, yeah. Yeah. you know, wow. to, to have a, a cool family member, which is, Praise I think God. one of the beautiful things about yeah. what football can provide. Sure. We'll True. talk about some of the negatives it can, it, it does provide. And when we put all of our faith and all our eggs in that basket, but it does provide some cool moments. And then last, last mm -hmm. weekend, I took my kids to their first hush, <laughs> right. you know, Come and on. so there was a great memory created mm -hmm. there. And so. Yeah, that's cool. It's a cool special moment for me too. On um, on the other side, as yeah, a fan, that's cool, bro. You know, so, thanks for sharing that, Alex. Yeah, what are what were, um, how did you or other players handle like some of the pressures of being kind of in the fishbowl? That I'm, you, you didn't know, want to talk about how that performance blessed you too. Oh yeah, so uh, <laughs> Eric, oh, Eric's from Iowa. I'm not from oh, Iowa. No, I'm actually well, not. South Dakota. So I'm from South, South Dakota. Dakota. So. Harmless. Yeah, <laughs> harmless. Know, harmless. I can say. Not true. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. It, it really, it was a really special moment for me. I got a tattoo. I'll show you later. Uh, <laughs> well, mama, don't know, don't hurt. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, but how did like how did you and the other pressure the other uh, players handle like this pressure of being kind of on this team? There's a lot of. I mean, I think a lot weighing on you. You know, from Nebraska fans alone uh, and things like that. Well, we felt it. We felt it from the top down. So our our um, our regime was Polini's regime, and. Um, and he felt the pressure, and when he would feel the pressure, we would feel the pressure. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't blame him at all. I actually thought uh, the pressure is not the issue, it's how we're gonna handle it. So I thought that we performed consistently really well because we always had 
a point to prove to ourselves, Mm -hmm. uh, to uh, the fan base especially. And so uh, it was always a performance mindset. And I will say I would – there were two types of people in our locker room, and the majority of people handled it differently. It was uh, it was it was strictly I'm going to perform to uh, to prove that I should be on the field and to prove that we're we're worthy of being cheered on and supported. Um, and then a point like uh, forget you, I'm giving you the bird. After we would lose, it was I'm it was the attitude of I'm giving you the bird, and so that was generally what we did as a team. And then there was like a small group of guys who would perform with a different mindset. And their mindset was something way greater. It was something eternal. We imagined ourselves putting deposits down in heaven and the attitude we took and how uh, we would handle momentum shifts, which happens all the time in college football, where our thoughts were during the game. And we actually um, we saw those moments as worshipful moments mm. where we failed a lot mm. in. But ultimately, there were a small group of guys who got that. And so uh, we saw the pressure overall. We saw the pressure uh, to be used. And for us, for for, uh, for a lot of guys, it was a lot about focus and proving people wrong. Uh, but for us, uh, we just knew it was there, and that wasn't going to be our motivation. Hmm. Um, is there anything you wish that you could have done differently in that time when you were there? Did you feel like, man, I really could have taken advantage of this, or I could have done something better, or... Or it was perfect. <clears throat> Nothing comes up immediately, to be honest. Okay. Um, and I could force something, but yeah. ultimately, I look back at my whole college experience, as flawed as it was, as overall a good experience mm-hmm. that pointed me towards something greater than myself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a whole. I had a whole lot of depression, whole lot of anxiety. I wanted to quit football at one point. I wouldn't trade any of that stuff. Yeah. Because it just it came with the human experience of playing for Nebraska or playing football, period, and always having to shuck off wanting to make everything about you. So it would have happened. It would have happened anywhere. Yeah. What was, as you're talking about, like, depression and stuff, what were, like, the drivers of that? Was that part of being in, like, the the fishbowl environment? Like, you drew the contrast between, like, a Cal who was number five in the nation at the time, like, not <laughs> even being able to fill the stadium in Nebraska, like – we are the greatest fans on the planet, right? That's what they continue to tell us. And we've got 1 million sellouts, consecutive sellouts, and all that kind of stuff. So that fishbowl is definitely in Nebraska, like all eyes on that. You right. know? So did that lead to some of that? Or was it interpersonal stuff? Or what was kind of the – or how, did, was, how yeah. did playing at Nebraska lead to, to that as a player? Uh, I'll tell a brief story. So, um, by the way, it come one. I do want to lead out with this. It comes with the territory. Uh, I wouldn't have had it any other way. The yeah. other way would have been like, you won't go undefeated, and you got a bunch of that much more fair weather fans who yeah. are just going to show up even even more differently. So, I appreciate our fan base that much more. Uh, but for instance. Um, there's something to be said when uh, when I'm going into my senior year, used to the pressure, and uh, I, coming off my junior year where I felt like everything was on my back. Um, I go into my my uh, senior year, and for the f- for the first time in my life, I had an object lesson. 2010 summer, three weeks before the season starts, it's World Cup FIFA time, mm. and I never watched soccer before. And what was freeing to me was. I watched and I saw that the world's eyes were on those dudes with their vuvuzelas and everything weird like that in South Africa. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, this is so relieving. The world doesn't revolve around me and my teammates and how well I do and perform on the field. Uh, So that being said, there was something to it to where my anxiousness did come up when when I wasn't careful about about what or who I'm playing for yeah, and the purpose of the skill set I've been given. So I will say, yeah, man, it's real. I'm not, I'm acknowledging that. And, uh, the second thing I'd probably say is, um, the interpersonal working of depression, uh, briefly is that in 2007, I was at the end of my rope coming from California. Uh, this 
confident kid um, because I knew I was good at what I did and uh, and I knew I was better than seniors and I was a freshman. And so I'm confident and yet, and I'm getting playing time and that's all I wanted. All I wanted to do was be, be playing as a freshman and the greater goal was to be, it'll sound silly because you guys know how far off I was from this, the greatest running back ever in college. That was my goal. Right? Alex is laughing like, listen, you had one good game, cuz, but you know. I mean, I, I say you're the it should be your goal, right? I mean, you should have high aspirations. So. High aspirations, but what I was doing was I, my scorecard was just off. I wanted to compare myself to yeah. everyone else. Everyone has a skill set. You can be as good as you want, and yet you can't be the greatest if I can't if I have no hips to move laterally like other dudes. So, anyways, so uh, I ended up getting to the end of my rope, and uh, it was at that point in 2007 where I experienced uh, a love that I'd never experienced before that changed my life. So that was the depression, and thereafter, um, just just battles. I'm gonna be honest, dude. Like this is gonna be sound funny, but the weather here in the winter sucks it does and it's depressing for a guy coming from california so it can also be depressing for someone who grew up in the midwest (laughs) i I mean it just is man it is two weeks ago it was all cloudy and i was anyways i bought a happy light guy texts me in the morning on sunny days and like man (laughs) praise the the joy of the lord the sun is out oh so you better know that that, yeah. that affected me as well, to be honest. So that was it, man. That was my conscience. And it's got to be worse when you have to like wait. I mean, when you're in winter, you're not even just suffering through it, but you're suffering through waiting until, right. I mean, mm-hmm. you're having to lift weights. You're doing all the terrible parts of football, right. getting ready for the, the season and hopefully a spring game to finally blossom. Right. One, one thing I think pressure wise that I always think when I watch a game and I watch post game is like, what is it like? Because if, if I give my performance, quote unquote, if I'm, I'm preaching and, and I'm like stepping up to, to the mic and preaching and proclaiming the gospel, there's still like parts of me that wonders how I did and people come <laughs> yeah. up to you and they're like, hey, good job or not. What is it like to have to step up to a microphone after that yeah. and have people ask you a bunch of questions, whether it's good or bad? Like I can't imagine like preaching and then walking back into a back room <laughs> we and then start doing a bunch that. of people oh, uh, oh, a bunch of people saying oh, oh my goodness <laughs> whether, I, whether I did good or I felt like I did bad well, what Can does it feel analyze? like to be in that moment like yeah. to just be a player I think that's overlooked and to, that's a good to, question I wonder I that when I watch it sometimes that. I didn't even see that Alex uh, it comes with it comes with the job so I never thought like that in terms of, <laughs> and I, I guarantee those other dudes, uh, at least they don't think uh, as structured as you did, well thought out as you did. But I will say everyone gets their feelings. Uh, okay, so it's just like sermon feedback. Um, when people praise you in the pulpit, you're never as good as what they really are saying. Um, and then and then when you hear criticism, you're never really as bad as, as what they're saying for a lot of the haters and so you go in (laughs) you go in and you're done and i remember the 307 game it was jolly it was great people were affirming me and god just really i think it was because i also had the the flu or the the head cold wait you were like michael jordan in the playoffs wow (laughs) wow i I didn't want to say it but that's public now (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's out there so can't get it back but uh but yeah, you just have opportunities uh, where people are gonna affirm you, and then people are gonna. It's funny, people will or they ask gently because they know that they want to ask you a question the next week, so they won't just say you're bad though. Yeah. So that's the good thing is they'll lead out and, and they'll say something like, "How about that fumble in the fourth quarter when you guys had the ball and you were on the one yard line and you needed to go in and score and you jumped over the pile and you ended up fumbling it back and then they took it for a score? How was that?" You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so yeah um how did it go um i uh i will say this and whatever questions we will ask thereafter this this is generally going to apply unless i was unless i had my my suit my my jersey on my christian jersey on my armor on a breast a breastplate a sword the word of God, unless I had my shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the peace of God that comes from the gospel that were on my feet. And that practically looked like, Roy, were you reading the word of God regularly, like since last game day? <laughs> unless I was there and in the spirit, I was always feeding into whatever it was. Mm. Yeah. So the great thing it was, was um, 
I felt like God protected me from feeling like uh, it was mandatory and I was obligated to get good feedback. Yeah. And it was just a part of the job. Yeah. Did you ever feel, and this is a little different, like Samson? Is that why you like grew your hair out? <laughs> or like, do you feel like less now that your hair is a lot shorter than when you played in Nebraska? Or what Yeah, that, Glenn wants me thing? to grow my hair out again. I do. Yeah. It, it ain't happening. All right, just just Google Roy. And I'm doing it good, for him. Some good hair. Yeah, I uh, quick story behind that. So I grew. Uh, um, I get bored with stuff sometimes. So hair was the thing for me to express. This is something I could do to shake things up. <laughs> and uh, it's funny once I you know so I'd grow my hair out, and then I grew it out three times in college. Uh, no, no, two times in college, and then I grew it out once in the NFL. And so uh, eventually when we had our first kid, I cut it all off and it was time for, in my opinion, for me to grow up. Mm -hmm. Um, That's at least what I say. 25, first kid. uh, And I said to myself, I think it's time just to cut it all off. And growing your hair, man, it takes a lot of chutzpah. (laughs) I mean... I don't know how to use that word all the time, man. That's what I'm dealing with right now. (laughs) So much chutzpah. Yeah. Yes. I don't know where we go from hoodspot. <laughs> yeah, Eric, do you, have another, do you have another question for us after that? <laughs> um, well, let's talk. Maybe just talk a little bit about you mentioned the NFL. Like yeah. how how was that? You know, different from your time with the Huskers. Mm. What so different? Um, what like what was the what did success look like there? And how did that kind of form your identity? Success looked like making the team there. Okay, success in college <laughs> meant you were starting, and so that that was the big difference. Mm. Um, it's a job in the NFL, and it's a duty in college. Woo! You can hashtag that one, cause that one's <laughs> off the top of the dome right there. Sorry, sometimes I feel my own words. It's obnoxious. <laughs> so uh, it was a, it was a duty. Uh, it was an honor. You felt like you're representing your team in college, representing the state, especially for local Nebraska boys especially there. I felt yeah. like I represented overall our team. They took it further and said, no, this is this is our state. And so um, with that being said, we ended up, sheesh. I forgot the question that you asked because I thought I kept look, thinking about how good that I, I mean, I guess just kind of like. <laughs> <laughs> this, That'll happen the, to me. The differences between the NFL. And yeah, okay, football. thank you. And then in the NFL, so it felt like it was like, yeah, it's fun. We're representing what we want to represent, and mm. we're all in this thing together. And then you're an uh, independent contractor when you go to the NFL. Mm. And so when you're when you're there, what you do is you could re- you, you could think that you represent your family, but it was more like uh, let me get food on the table because now this is real life. So it was totally different. Conversations mm. were uh, a lot more quick and shallow. You don't build camaraderie because if you look at the New England Patriots, it's a revolving door. And so uh, I had to worry about, which I did for for a couple months during my, my uh, time with the Redskins, is am I going to walk in and get fired? You didn't think about that in Nebraska. You were just like, yeah. oh, no, I'll get PT even if, if uh, Coach Beck wants to sit me. So that was overall the difference. And when you get hit in the NFL, you hit by you hit get hit by grown grown men, real grown men. Mm-hmm. I mean, they hit you and you get a stinger that your grandma will feel. <laughs> I, and it, in college, you can get hit and they'll attack you unless you're going you're you're playing a beast of a couple guys on defense. Usually, you get the best of the best in college in, in the NFL. Yeah. What. Uh like having a successful NFL career, playing in in college, you know, having you're you're still in the record books at Nebraska, right? For that game, yeah. yeah. What did that do to your identity? You know, mm. how, how did how did that shape your identity? How did that feed into an identity of putting Roy on the throne? And mm. then how did that? How was that constant tension between who's on the throne of your heart, yeah. like between Christ and you? I'm assuming. You were a believer heading into college, or or no. did something change there? Or 
So how how did that happen? Yeah, I'll back up real quick. That goes back to the depression. Um, I was very familiar uh, with uh, the good news of Jesus my last two years of high school. Grew up in a non-Christian household. Mom got born again my sophomore year. So then she's saying, you're leaving. Will you end up doing me a favor? Come to church with us. Ended up hearing the good news from about 05 to uh, 05 and 06. Ended up coming here. um, And the good news was good information. It was just mm. it was just good information. It was mm. like who doesn't want to be a moral person for the most part, and so I, it didn't connect. I, I knew enough in my head, but the twelve inches that really mattered had not happened yet. Where mm. it makes it makes it down to your heart and transforms your life. That happened because I got to the end of my rope, where I cried out and said, "God, if you exist, will you allow me to understand? Will you will you show me basically truth?" Sat down to the village inn in 2007 in the fall, my freshman year, as things were going great. And it was six in the morning after my punishment run. And I sat down across <laughs> with him and I asked him, as a young freshman, I said, What does it mean to be a Christian? This is a coach, right? This, this was the team chaplain. I'm team sorry. chaplain, yeah. Yep, yep. And uh, I was familiar with Christianity, so I called him up, not my, not my coach. So what happened was he ends up. Uh, walking through the good news by way of bad news well first he started and talked about man you have been created in god's likeness and in his image you you belong to him and uh you're created for a relationship with him and what you're experiencing is your sin everyone's born with sin he walked me through romans road specifically talked about my sin what i was Mm -hmm. earning what the wages of that was and that was death eternal separation from god hell that wasn't scary to me though what was compelling to me was what he shared after. And after that, he ended up sharing how the God of the universe did something about it. While we were in our worst, God gave his best. He stepped yeah. down, motivated by love, John three sixteen. God sent his son for us. And he ended up coming, living a perfect, sinless life, righteousness in hand, goes to the cross, ends up uh, verifying that he truly was the son of God by the empty tomb. And he has a gift for us. We could be made right with God. I don't have to pay the penalty of sin, and I don't have have to live. This was compelling. Live under the power of sin, which was what I was experiencing mm-hmm. in depression, mm-hmm. a whole bunch of darkness. Now I can I say depression, but to quickly unpack that, you walk outside of your dorm room, and it could be spring, totally sunny outside, and yet it's it's the dead of winter in your soul, gloomy, uh, despair sorrow, sadness, all new for this 18-year-old, 17-year-old kid, and ultimately leading to hopelessness. So there I was in my depression. I'm just not, I'm sitting in a different posture ready to receive. And so uh, dude put me on the spot and said, listen, this, this is true, that God ended up coming and he lived a perfect and sinless life and he has your righteousness in hand. Would you believe in your heart that he, he rose on the third day And would you uh, confess with your lips that he's Lord and Savior? And I wasn't expecting that. I was like going for a powwow. Like, let's TED talk this. (laughs) (laughs) And so, and uh, he put me right on the spot and I said, yes. As soon as the syllable came out, I'm not kidding you. What What I just shared with you, the feelings of that actually were lifted off. It was a weight. And immediately I experienced what the scriptures say is a peace that transcends all understanding. And so I experienced love. I experienced, I experienced the God of the universe as my comforter first. And it was as though that I needed to uh, come to the end of myself and experience the God of the universe. And then after I was like, man, something is definitely changed i have a peace that i've never even known Mm. even even before depression i knew in my soul that god was true that jesus truly was the son of god that yahweh amongst all the gods of our culture whether it be youth sports or like i was involved in whether it be music or or uh or movies or hollywood whatever it may be work whatever you're going to circulate as your gods that was the god worth worshiping Mm -hmm. Amen. So that was my experience of how I came to know Christ. And then um, to piggyback on the second part of the question, it had to do with identity, correct, Alex? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, can you frame that real briefly? Because I could talk about identity in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I think where where did you find your source of identity as Husker football player, NFL yeah. player, yeah, and, yeah, it's so and good. son of God? And how did those yeah. two – they had to have competed and had collision courses at some oh. at some point. So what did that what did that look like? 
he just put the wind into the mic. <laughs> He's already responding to what he's about to say. That was that. Uh, that was that Pentecost win. Just in case you wanted to know, spirits about to drop right now. So, uh, yes, competed, still competes. By the way, still competes That's with good. my That's dad. That's good. So, uh, um, what ended up happening was, praise God, that a man said to me, "Okay, now you're. I'm going to disciple you." And in discipleship, the point of it is that you would get a man to the point where he would he would obey the teachings of Christ. He would obey the commandments of the law because he's motivated by love for God. And that's where the good news of Jesus comes in, right, fellas? So uh, what ends up what ended up happening was uh, during my college years, um, the, my favorite stor- story to share as I was going back and forth was uh, my identity in terms of being uh, my junior year, this being my junior year. And I have everything pointed trending in because my the end of my sophomore year being very good ju- the beginning of junior year trending up and to the right in terms of it's time to go get mm-hmm. paid mm-hmm. it's time to go get paid 20 years old i'm trying to make the millies and so uh so my my focus my mind because of the success i had was all on that mm. so what i ended up doing was i ended up um uh having an amazing first three weeks and things are looking amazing. I'm going to leave. That's still in my mindset. And during this whole time, it affected me so much that I skipped every Friday class every Friday. And I would just do the homework or whatever. And uh, that was not against, that was against policy. So I did that so I would give my legs a break and I wouldn't walk campus, which was just so silly. That's how much I wanted to do well. I wanted to perform. That's what it was. I wanted to perform so well so I could earn um, the NFL draft early status. I got injured. Short of the long of it is, it really tested my identity, really bought, brought me back down to grassroots. Um, you can say you're a Christian, and unless you're re- Romans 12, you're renewing your mind. Yeah, I, I just shared with you, I tasted and I saw the goodness of God in 2007. Here I am two years later, and I f- I'm operating as if I was the old Roy. And it, I was not renewing my mind with God's word. Um, which is uh, inspired by God and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. And so there I was thinking again that um, what what I did, uh, what I could do in performance in my identity, I could I could always earn uh, my validation. Right. And so what ended up happening was I got hurt. It was so humbling, guys. At the end, they came in and all the scouts talked to all my friends and none of them talked to me. <laughs> I had such a bad end of it. Yeah. And uh, another running back was getting so much praise and he was an amazing guy. So I didn't even hate on that. So at the end of it, um, the big identity crisis that I had was, are you, is your worth going to be tied up in what you do? and the ups and downs of it or is it going to be tied into god sealing you by his spirit and there saying, it is yep and, yeah and, and saying hey whatever you're looking for first off you never earned it in terms of your righteousness yep yep and uh don't don't think that i don't have your your life in hand mm-hmm. um and and for me it was a big big monumental um Release and like a shedding off of the old self was I'm going to get affirmation in the really good things that I've done. Yeah. And I cannot live in that. My identity is truly caught up in that. Yeah. Oh, the wind's in here. It's back again. <laughs> the wind is back. Thanks, Glenn, for the sound effects. <laughs> uh, let's, so, all right, let's, pay, let's pivot a little bit and kind of just jump into this whole Husker culture that is Nebraska and kind of, uh, you know, maybe let's talk a little bit about where it can go too far and yeah. what that looks like. And maybe, maybe we can all kind of identify that or, you know, say, Hey, this is maybe a bit much, maybe, oh. or maybe you're a little too invested in this, in this, uh, team. I mean, for me personally, like, I, I mean, if I'm honest, I was the, I was the anti Husker for a lot of years. Like I was, I, I, I grew up in South Dakota. I, I knew my cousins lived here and they loved Huskers and it was all about that. And I'd come visit and I was just 
confused. I'm like, what <laughs> are you guys doing? Like, why is this such a big deal? Been there. And so there, yeah. there are all these like these big events and like the 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 Husker uh, championship game. And I don't know what year it is. So I don't know. It was in the 90s. And uh, we. Uh, <laughs> the good, the good years, there were, right? Yeah, there was yeah, some. It was one of those, <laughs> maybe. It was the good years. Oh, that's classic. I have no idea. So that's how. That's how much uh, I know. Poor Eric Crouch. Uh, so uh, we were. I remember being at my my cousin's house, and they're having this big party, and they like had everybody write down like who they thought was going to win. And I just spitefully wrote down the other team. I don't even remember who they were playing. Oh, you I was so just, seemed I was like that, just, Eric. Oh, I, I just, knew it when I came I was in such here. A, such a jerk, right? And uh, so I put that. I put that down. I'm just like, ah, look at me. I'm. I'm. I'm funny. And, and then and I don't remember if they won or lost, but I just remember my cousins being so upset at me and so yeah. mad at me. Like I brought bad juju in the house. Like I just like ruined it for them. And I felt bad. And I later on, I was like, oh, I shouldn't have done that, whatever. But I will say in 2014, my life changed. Uh, I, <laughs> I came to know the Huskers. Um, so, <laughs> so, uh, no, I had a, I really did have kind of like a life changing moment because I, my wife won tickets through her where she works to a game in and in and we got to be in the stadium and i'm like i'm just gonna go get you. I'm, gonna, get I'm, gonna, you. I'm gonna go i was That's like true. ah whatever i'm not and i tell you what i was like the biggest fan from yeah. there on out. like it just the energy in that place yeah, just yeah. be like it's like all this started to make sense and it was such a mm-hmm. weird thing just yeah. being around that energy and like and since then i mean i'm a big bull Bo Pelini sympathizer. I'm, mm. You know, I really thought. I knew I liked you. I take that back. Um, Bo always, I loved when he would just like kind of yell at the fans and be like, <laughs> like, you're stupid. Like, just get over it. Like, whatever. What do you expect from me? And so I kind of love Bo. And that's because that's kind of when I, you know, really got on board with the Huskers too. So that's, I see. Bo's my papa. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that's just, that's kind of my experience. But, but I do think like people get so passionate about it and so enraged over, you know, win or lose or whatever. And I, you know, what does it, what does it look like to kind of maybe take it too far? Mm. I feel like this is a good one for Alex. Yeah, Alex. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> With the blinking that, LED Husker yeah. hat, I feel like we right need now. to get Alex involved <laughs> yeah. in here because there's something to be said from a dude who's watching the tube. Yeah, yeah, compared yeah. Compared to the dude who's, and then I'll give you all on the other side okay. of the dude who's playing on the field. That is, and I feel like there is such a. I grew up in Nebraska, grew yeah. up a Husker fan. I got the blinking hat on right now that I won <laughs> with my tag. That's on your wife's, still. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we don't want to talk about it. anyway. So I grew up and, but always in the church culture where there was always like this, I just remember Sundays being at church and, you know, hearing pastors say, you guys can cheer at the Husker game yesterday, but you can't cheer for God. Why don't you guys clap a little bit more? And I grew up in like this culture where they're like, Mm. you should praise God the way you, you praise the Huskers. And you know you have it in you because I saw you acting like a fool yesterday cheering <laughs> yeah. for the Huskers and then you come to church and you just got that blank stare on your face. And I, I remember like looking at the pastor and be like, what are you talking about, dude? And then now on the other side as a, as a pastor and mm-hmm. I'm, you know, I go to Husker games and I see the fandomonium and I'm a fan as well right. and go to these parties and everyone gathers and there's an excuse to gather. We don't have weddings on those days. Like all of that. And then, like, I'm I'm preaching the good news up here, mm. you know, on a Sunday morning. And, like, guys, this is something that's eternally you should be cheering for. And, like, I got people just, like, looking at <laughs> me, like, when is this going to be over? You know? Yes. And, and so, like, uh, so that, classic. like, those are the Go tensions that I'm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But as a pastor, like, of course I would say that because I got mad at the pastors growing up for saying stuff like that. And, like, you just can't understand and, and all that kind of stuff. And. I do think the beautiful thing about Husker football and why there's all these sellouts and things like that is because there is something powerful about the state. Like why the, why the running out on the field, why the tunnel walk is so amazing, why that experience for you is so amazing. Yes, it's the players, but it's also the collective of people That's that it. are there mm. worshiping something together, whether we mm. call it worshiping or not. And so there's this powerful thing where a collective of people – and that's why I think Nebraska keeps succeeding is because they keep telling the fans that they are the best. You guys are the best. <laughs> and and literally, we Classic. need you. We need you to make yeah. this happen. And maybe that's where maybe the church could learn a lesson mm. is actually being convinced that we need not just the people on the field, not just the people on the stage, not mm. just the people in paid positions, but actually as pastors equipping the saints like our job. And, uh, and so how do, how do we continue to do that? 
and convince people, uh, man, this thing would fall apart without you. You That's know, so, so good, Alex. from a pastoral perspective, those are some of my, my thoughts mm. on it. But I, but I feel like I'm supposed to say that, right? Because I'm a pastor mm. and I'm supposed to like bash one or the other. So mm. as a player, like, have you had experiences where like people's, cause so people's, good, Alex. their emotions, yeah. like, they can go from the most excited, friendly guy at the beginning of the game to literally moping at the end of a loss, like, <laughs> like Colorado a few weeks ago. Like, I experienced oh. that with a few people. Like moping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like they That's are classic. so excited. They traveled all the way there and like they, it's it's like they just got the worst. Someone yeah. called them like bad news. Mm. Well, and you feel if you're if you're a, a fan mm. and you're not one of those people, you walk away from a loss and you're exactly the same way as when you walked in. Right. You kind of feel out of place. Unfaithful. Yeah. 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 But no one's like that at our table, right, Glenn? <laughs> mm. uh, <laughs> Glenn's the biggest Husker fan I know. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Check mm. out his shirt. That's a, how do you say that? University of Nebraska. Yeah, <laughs> just a different mm. campus. Yeah, yeah, just, a, yeah just Omaha. Mm. It's not a big deal. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm gonna break it down real spiritual, like real quick. Um, in Colossians, it says, "Man, if if you if you've been raised with Christ, basically, if if Jesus is your Lord and Savior." Um, then you set your mind on things above. You seek the things above. And uh, what that looks like is Christ, who is, it says later, Christ, who is your life. You also appear with him in glory. Praise, praise God on. for that. Mm-hmm. If, if uh, it goes too far when fans make this their life, and here's what it looks like. You touched on it a little bit earlier. Uh, mood swings mm-hmm. beyond days. Um. I'm not even going to say you're not taking it too far when you have mood screens within a game because you just get caught up. We're all human beings. But yeah. when it, you know, for instance, hypo, you know, back in the day, we all know the stats. They were, when, whenever Nebraska would lose in the 90s, domestic abuse went up. Yeah. That's, That's terrifying. The, right. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, we're, we, we, we don't see those stats anymore. And I don't know if, if that's true anymore of us or not. Supposedly church attendance went down too, right? When they oh, lost. oh, okay. Yeah. I yeah, didn't even know the that. Oscars lose on a, yeah, on a Saturday then. Yeah. Here's the big point I want to get across though. If you view those players without seeing that they literally just had puberty. <laughs> mm-hmm. For real, though. They just got out of puberty, and they are getting a free education with free meals for your entertainment. If you don't see that and you're empathetic towards that, I think you're going to fall into worship more than not. Yeah, Mm -hmm. That is my personal opinion coming out of Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Um, Other than that, like Alex teed up earlier, it's an amazing thing. Yeah. So good. Brings us together. It does. Yeah, it does. it does. But I think without that perspective, like, oh, it was so refreshing. We had Christians that would that would tell our team chaplain that they're praying for us. That was so relieving because everywhere else it was judgment, judgment, judgment. We're not getting paid. You want to judge someone or whatever in, in terms of, um, I won't say judge, judge their, be entertained by their performance or whatnot, but, but it seems like this. In our fan base, we come down. We're we're the best fan base, but being the best fan base only means that we care the most. Which means, just like an idol, it controls our emotion. We have the biggest swing of emotion mm-hmm. when we do well or someone does well. We love being a part of the story, but it seems like we don't really praise those dudes who do well. And yet, when we go when we're doing bad, so uh, you know, maybe two years ago doing bad. When we fired our coach, man, I heard people talking bad about players, mm. uh, about th- the coaches getting paid. So I will say that's legitimate. But I just heard it was just just visceral everywhere. It just went mm. everywhere. So mm. I think that is a practical way to take your pulse and say, huh, what is this? What does this look like for mm. for for it to go too far? Yeah, yeah. That's good. I was I was doing like just a, a little bit of research on some of this like people that get really into fandom and what that looks like, and I I came across this theory called terror management theory. Oh yeah, yeah. And it, and it said uh, it said that when uh, p- 
people become aware of their own mortality, they, they start to seek out like important groups that they can bond with. Mm. And like, this is something that it, it kind of justifies their existence in a way. Mm. And so I think that sometimes I think as humans, right, we're all like looking for that thing. And, you know, and when you don't maybe find that in Christ or find that in your, in, in the gospel, then you start to just latch on and to other things almost in an unhealthy way. Mm. And I, you know, and I think that's kind of what we're dealing with here in a little bit is like people are wanting to have that feeling of belonging and they put so much meaning behind this, this athletic event Mm. and this culture um, that that's where I think we do start to see that stuff get unhealthy. Right. Good. Quick as a parent question, I'm, I got four kids and so you, you know, played, at Nebraska, top of the, you know, top of the chain as far as football, colleges and programs. You played in the NFL. You mm-hmm. have a wife, right, that played uh, in Nebraska? Yep. She played volleyball. volleyball yep. And that's kind of the, our, our secondary religion. Sometimes people yeah. flip it on when Nebraska's losing because they're really good at volleyball. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So, so as good. you, as parents who are raising kids you both, I assume, played growing up. You talked about mm-hmm. that earlier and mm-hmm. sports were important. You don't just show up one day and make these teams because just because you look good, you know, even though you do look good. So as you're raising your kids through your experience at the highest level, what, what are some of the things that you guys are wrestling through now? Um, that we as parents, because I think there is this battle between youth sports and culture and how it's taking over Mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. What do you have that you can speak into from Mm somebody that's been through the gauntlet that I don't, I've, no one knows anything about my sports glory days at Burke High School, you know. So yeah, we heard about that. Yeah, yeah. So and Grace uh, yeah. School of the Bible. Yeah, Ooh, which is then sports there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ouch. Anyway, Pickleball? your boy bald. Let's go back. Pickleball? Let's, Pickleball? Yeah, let's oh, go basketball. Yeah, let's go back. Yeah, let's go back to your the question at hand. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, I want to talk about Grace University athletics. So. No, let's go back. <laughs> let's go back to Roy. <laughs> how, at parenting, like seriously, yes. how do yeah. you, how are you guys approaching that? Oh man, this is might be the best question of the day. How are we approaching that? I'll speak real briefly because I want this to be a poignantly answered. So, um, I have been to the top of the food chain in the NFL and started started there. Went to multiple teams. Was good enough to get a new contract. And then below there, everything else just built up. You have to be good at college. You have to be all that stuff. So you're talking about, I'm sorry, I'm boasting in this, but there's a point here. A guy who is less than 1% saying this remark right now, you putting your kids in youth sports, football specifically, does not form their character one bit. Mm. Doesn't form it does not make your kid uh, more joyful, doesn't doesn't uh, make him uh, more peaceful, uh, more merciful, uh, doesn't make them listen to you more. <laughs> that is a misconception in culture. And that will always most likely be a misconception in culture. Uh, the reality is, uh, speaking from this, is uh, I shared with you guys my story. And uh, I was a very flawed man, broken, bad character, although I seem wholesome because I didn't talk nearly as much as myself, at least. And the only thing that ended up rewiring my heart was a relationship with an eternal God. Everything else falls short. So here's what it practically looks like. In football, if character... Uh, if, if in football, if if football formed someone's character, you got to tell me why is it every year there's domestic abuse in the NFL? Why are guys getting kicked out all the time? They played sports since they they played tackle football since they were three in Texas. Yeah, <laughs> that doesn't do it. So I do want to speak into that misconception, and that relays then to what then should be the vision for your children. And so because Danielle and I have both been there, the number one thing we want to do is form our, in in a simple way, form our kids' character. And the greatest thing that we can do, Scripture says, is is that uh, to point them towards Jesus, to point them towards a God who mercifully and uh, with compassion gave himself up for us. 
moved towards us and has new life for us. And the, the good news of Jesus ends up compelling us to live lives that love God and are obedient, serving other people, things that, you know, us Christians would walk out if we didn't say one word, everyone would be like, oh man, that's a moral person. So um, the heart of it is where we see our kids, as scripture says, as a gift and a reward, no matter if we don't in this season, <laughs> it's the truth of things. Their gifts, their rewards, the responsibility that we have as parents is that we get the imagery in the Old Testament of a quiver of arrows. So a, a little little bag of arrows. Each one of our kids are that arrow. We have a responsibility to direct them mm-hmm. towards wherever, but specifically towards Jesus. So with all that being said, I'm going to give real practicals. Here's the real practical. Uh, with knowing all those things, the, f- the, uh, the best way that we see in Scripture to form our kids' character is around the household. So dining room table is huge. My responsibility, the grace I show my bride, and especially she shows towards me, uh, will end up showing our kids that this God that we talk about, we also really follow. The tongue in our mouth, in other words, goes with the tongue in our shoes. We're about it. We're just about it. And we're, we're going we're gonna to end up living that way in front of them. And we're going to talk about why. And we're going to point them to Jesus. Um, so with that being said, the household, the table, that's where it's at for our family. Um, and uh, that means things are. we're going to have to say no to good things. Youth sports, we're going to say no to for some time. We're going to say no because uh, we see way more benefit and them understanding God and them understanding uh, themselves in view of God and their brokenness and their need for God and just understanding responsibility, like mm-hmm. just straight up being like, uh, I was the I was the least responsible kid growing up in my household and yet I was so good at football. How does that match up? <laughs> and so uh, literally sitting precedent at the home, disciplining, getting our kids disciplined, but at the heart of it, knowing the reason why we're doing those things. So with all that being said, we're making um, the table the way that we uh, disciple our children because that's what we're called to do and that's the best form that me and my bride see in scripture. Um, and uh, youth sports, that means we're going to have to put that on pause. Mm. And uh, I don't know when. I couldn't give you guys a time. Um, but I, it's, it's interesting because I see talent in my kids to play football. Right. I, see, I see the arm in my kid. I see the lateral quickness in my kid. Um, I see the, the, the straightforward speed of my kid. I see how cute my daughter is. <laughs> but how she but she she's not coordinated i will say that so i see i see all those things and i i have to make sure that those things come secondarily uh but know that that's a part of my parenting is to direct them into what they desire to do mm-hmm. in due time so your oldest is how old five five yeah and he's not playing sports right now no okay. and we get questions all the time oh you don't have your kids in and you soccer no, no, we don't have them in youth soccer. What for? What purpose? Do you not see that it would kill our marriage? Like we have, yeah. <laughs> we we literally have five, four, three, two, one. Like yeah. people are killing themselves, and it's so funny. It's new to the metro. Uh, you know, the grandpas and grandmas right now are saying, "Oh, that that's not that's not what it used to be like. That youth sports, you guys pay way too much. It's year round baseball. <laughs> that's killing you guys. It's family time." That, like most things, the precedent was sent on the West Coast, and that's the way I grew up. And it's funny. That's all you know as a kid. So yeah. praise God that those kids are innocent enough to where that's all they they know is busy, busy, busy. But at the end of the day, um, values are suffering if you care about those. And marriages are definitely don't yeah. definitely don't have as much depth as uh, former generations. Letting them be a kid. Yes, you know, that's right. My simply, kids are playing sandbox still, yeah. and I love it. Let them find their imaginations, right? Stuff like that. I mean, I think we got to the successful point because Grandma Helu came out on the show, and so I think one more is there to even. <laughs> oh, that yeah. More is there? Even I did hear her out. there for yeah, a little I heard bit. Her. <laughs> she she spoke. She gave her her word. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see it. Is there know. anything else to say? <laughs> no, I, think I think I covered most of it. Yeah. No, I think yeah. It's it's one of the things where you know. Example, exemplifying what a what a um, 
it's so cliche to say a Christian Husker fan, but like what, like just to wrap it up, like what is that? Like what, what are, what does that look like? Is it, uh, is it maybe missing a game for a, a church event? Like, would that be okay? Like, is that, would that, or would that, <laughs> you know, not be okay? Oh man. What it, what it exactly looks like, bro. Uh, for a Christian, uh, Husker fan, so much freedom there, whatever mm-hmm. it'll look like. Um, I hate to always go through, uh, with non-essential things go through, well, this, this, that, that, Yeah. Uh, but I will say, uh, man, there's something to be said about, um, your time watching the game and, uh, your time thinking on things above, whether it's praying throughout the week, whether it's, uh, yeah. loving your bride thoughts towards God, reading the word of God. So I think there's something to be said there. Uh, whatever you're going to be thinking on the most will capture your heart in that season. Yeah. And we just got a bunch of spineless men in Christianity right now. Yeah. I went there. I'm sorry. I, I don't you know. I, I figured this is uncomfortable. Yeah. Go so for I it. might as well make no, it. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. It, it, that was uncomfortable to even say. I didn't even mean to go there, guys. But we do have a bunch of guys who have their identities crossed. Uh, who watch football and say, I want my kid to, I want to live vicariously through my kid. Mm-hmm. Um, I want validation through my kid. I want my kid to get validation I didn't have. Yeah. And uh, where do you see that? Where do you see that in God's word? Um, I don't. I feel like our jobs is, as as fathers are to look at our sons. And uh, when Jesus got baptized, God the Father when, when Jesus got the Holy Spirit there, he ended up affirming them in a couple ways. Mm-hmm. So he acknowledged him, spoke assurance over him, said he loved him. So that's what I see. Yeah. Uh, see, we're just, we just get mixed up. I love this conversation. Uh, and we, uh, this is nothing new. Yeah. This is nothing new for Nebraska. Bunch of Uncle Rico dads out there. <laughs> <laughs> Watch wow. me throw the football over this mountain, son. Yeah. Bring that Napoleon I saw that, Dynamite. I had a reunion this week, and so I remembered Uncle Rico and how yeah. far he could throw the football. All so. right, good. All right, well, I think I think that, that pretty much does it for what we're here for today. I mean, I think we could have go, go deeper and on and on and on and on about this. Uh, but, no, we really appreciate your time and yeah. your insight on this, and it's I think it's valuable for everyone to hear this. Um, you probably have a little – uh, more cloud to say these things than us uh, who did not play for the Huskers. Even so, Alex? Sorry. I mean, Alex, Alex, pl- Alex is Alex second close. Grace Pickleball. Uh, yep, Grace Pickleball. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out, I'll give you an autograph later. Uh, yeah, and he did see you at that game, so that was yes, special. Yes, that's too. true. That's true. Um, all right. No, but uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for being here. Yeah, we really appreciate my it. My pleasure, fellas. Thank you. Uh, but that does it for us here today. Um, please, if you want to get us get at us on social media, you can do that by sending us a message at cccomaha.org or you can email us uh, that's podcast at cccomaha.org if you won't have any questions or feedback for us we'd love to hear it don't forget to uh, rate and review this podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen we do greatly appreciate that uh, and we'll see you next time goodbye goodbye